Radio for Readers Bookmark. This is Bookmark. I'm Mark Furnier. The nation's top authors are coming up next. The Miami Book Fair is nothing short of history, and here we go back to World War II, FDR and the Jews, a collaborative effort between Richard Brightman and Alan Fleichman. Uh, Richard Brightman, who is still teaching at American University, actually lectured once at Embry-Riddle in Prescott, Arizona, joins us now for the Bookmark program. Richard, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You know, there is an, a common belief by Americans that we are extremely passive to the plight of Jews in Europe at the beginning of World War II. In this book, FDR and the Jews, do we know uh, for sure how FDR felt about this? We know to the best of our ability with the existing sources. Roosevelt was a difficult person for historians. He was a secretive man. He didn't keep a diary. He didn't write lots of long personal letters. Um, he didn't write lots of long memoranda. He didn't allow cabinet minutes. He didn't allow people meeting with him to take notes. So we had to search far and wide in other people's diaries and in other people's papers reconstructing conversations with Roosevelt. And it took us five years. Really? Yes. Yeah, I wasn't aware of all these little idiosyncrasies about Roosevelt not keeping records. Did staff keep stuff from Roosevelt? Staff kept stuff for Roosevelt, and occasionally they kept stuff from Roosevelt when they thought this was not an issue to go to him. In this case, in the plight of Jews in Europe with Hitler trying to virtually exterminate an entire people, was Roosevelt so fixed on domestic policy that he really didn't feel like he had time or interest? What was going on with him? Well, um, we talk about Roosevelt's four phases as president. And you have to realize that he was president for a long time. Conditions changed radically over the uh, 12 or so years. So in the first term, Roosevelt was fixated on domestic policy. He uh, was aware that Hitler was a serious threat, uh, but the United States had very little leverage in Europe and no military forces to speak of. So Roosevelt basically um, watched from a distance without doing much, even with regard to immigration. That was the first Roosevelt. The second Roosevelt came after he got reelected by a landslide in 1936. And at the time, he thought it was his last term. You have to realize that. So his last chance to do things. And he still couldn't do much in foreign policy because the, both the public and Congress were isolationist. But he thought he might be able to do something with regard to refugees, people who wanted to get out of Europe, and he encouraged that. In fact, he had a grand vision of millions of people, including millions of Jews, leaving Europe for other parts of the world. He, he insisted in 1938 on filling the immigration quotas, which hadn't been filled up until that time. And he also tried to encourage other countries, particularly Latin American countries, to take in Jews. So that was the second Roosevelt. The third Roosevelt is the wartime Roosevelt, who was very worried about um, the public seeing the United States as entering a war to protect Jews. And he shied away from public statements uh, denouncing Nazi atrocities against Jews. Were sensitivities in this country that high at that time? They were high in this country and they were high abroad. You have to realize that the first American action uh, in Europe and North Africa came in... 42, uh, 43? Yeah, in, in Muslim uh, territories with Muslim majorities and there was a widespread belief in North Africa that the Allies were fighting a war on behalf of the Jews. That's what the Nazis were themselves saying. All right, Richard, let's go back to 38, 39. We know Hitler is on the cusp. 39, it really starts. The election is going to be held in 40, I believe, correct? So this is, uh, we're looking at Roosevelt's third term and then he eventually runs again in 44. Has Roosevelt, do we know if Roosevelt puts in motion the mechanism to hand off to someone else and then changes his mind? Or does he start thinking in 38, 
I'm going to stick around because I'm not going to hand this mess over to somebody else. We don't have a precise date where Roosevelt said to himself or to others, I'm going to run for a third term until, you know, you get into the middle of 1940. And he obviously decided before then. But he knew that the war might determine the fate of Western civilization. And he felt that it was essential that the United States aid the enemies of Nazi Germany. And he felt that he could manage that better than anybody else could manage that. So I think you can say that his decision to run for a third term was very much tied up with the war, whether it came early in 1939, late in 1939, or at the beginning of 1940. Now, I'm curious to follow that question with 1944. Roosevelt is sick. From what I've read from other accounts, he has every intention of getting out, but we're still in a war. It looks like it's starting to go our way by 44, but presidents weren't sworn in, I think, at that time. I don't know. Had they moved the inauguration to January from March? It used to be March, then they moved it up. But I'm curious, did Roosevelt have to be dragged into running for that fourth term? He didn't really, because at that point he thought, He's the commander-in-chief, and he really had to see this to a finish. Okay. He, but he changes horses, so to speak, a few times. He changes vice presidents. And I think he, this is when he brings Truman in, because Truman finishes because Roosevelt dies in 45. Right. He Rose- got rid of Henry Wallace. Right. Why did he do that? Do we know? Does it have anything to do with this story of FDR and the Jews? Uh, it's not um, a central Uh, connection. Uh, Wallace was not on Roosevelt's wavelength, and politically he he did some things uh, a little too far to the left, caused some trouble, and Roosevelt thought somebody younger like Truman would be uh, safer and more pliable. Wow. Okay. So Roosevelt is sick. He goes to, is it Potsdam or Casablanca? He goes somewhere. He looks terrible. Yalta. It's Yalta. And it's the Yalta Conference. That's the last time Roosevelt sees Stalin and Churchill? Correct. What's going on there? Is this his discussion for the post-war um, separation or, hand, or breakups or what? Um, they're trying to determine the future fate and shape of Europe. That was kind of issue number one. They're trying to determine what's going to happen after the war in Europe is one you know, are the Soviets going to um, uh, participate in, in the war against Japan? And uh, so there are all kinds of big issues. Poland, for example, was a, a big uh, object of controversy. And what kind of government? Uh, Roosevelt was hoping for democratic elections. Stalin interpreted the word democratic very different than uh, Westerners uh, do and uh, the Soviets wanted to protect their security in the future because they'd suffered such uh, horrendous losses. So that's going on, but on the margins there was also the issue of Palestine and the issue of, you know, what's going to happen to the Jews who were remaining in Europe and that came up on the margins at Yalta and it came up even more after Yalta because Instead of going directly home, he was exhausted. Roosevelt went to the Middle East and met with Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia and tried to talk him into accepting the idea of large numbers of Jews going into Palestine. Do we know if during this time in your assemblage of information on the book FDR and the Jews, are there anti-Semites in the FDR administration? Yes. There are? Yes. There were anti-Semites in the country. There were anti-Semites in Congress. There were anti-Semites in uh, the administration. So he's having to dance around all of this? Yes. Does it become more successful as the war moves along? Roosevelt judged what he could try to do based on how secure he was politically and militarily. And as the war began to go better, uh, Roosevelt, and this is the shift from the third Roosevelt to the fourth Roosevelt, begins to listen to the criticism that if you just wait 
until the end of the war, there might not be that many Jews left. And so uh, he is pressured hard by his secretary of the treasury, uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr., and um, is given evidence that the State Department had been systematically frustrating efforts to relieve uh, the situation of Jews in Europe. And it was at, in January 1944 that he established a new agency, the War Refugee Board. In the last 18 months of the war, the board probably helped to save about 200,000 people. You know, what I'm wondering about is, while you're telling me this is going on, Roosevelt's involved in a few elections. He has to campaign in New York. He has to campaign in other pockets of the country where there are large Jewish uh, voting blocks. What kind of pressure is he getting, do we know, from those people for him to, to stand up for Jews? He was getting some pressure from uh, particular Jewish congressmen and Jewish organizations. But you have to realize, Roosevelt got 90% of the Jewish vote in his four elections. He he was so well-liked, some would say beloved, and his opponents were so um, disliked or at least uh, suspected of having the wrong uh, leanings that he was going to get the Jewish vote, maybe not 90 percent, but you know, 80 plus percent, regardless of what he did. There, there were no um, political uh, bonus points for him in doing something for European Jews. I think he did it eventually, partly because he was pressed into it by by Morgenthau, whom he he was close to Morgenthau, but partly also because he felt. The war situation now permitted it, and it was something that he really kind of messed up on earlier. Okay, finally, Roosevelt dies around April 12, 1945. It's the eve of the German surrender. The Japanese aren't going to quit for another four or five months. I'm curious, when Roosevelt dies, Truman comes in from Missouri, his latest vice president. Is there a concern among American Jews? Well, that's it. All bets are off. Now we got to play this guy. Is that going on, or do they just feel comfortable with Truman? Well, they don't feel comfortable with Truman yet, but uh, Truman did have a number of Jewish friends and contacts, uh, Eddie Jacobson from Missouri, and uh, so they they were not uh, pessimistic about Truman. Uh, Best Truman was anti-Semitic. Yeah, that that's was that's what I was getting to. Yeah, uh, so it, it wasn't clear how this was going to go. And it took a while before uh, Truman really learned enough about the issues that uh, were facing him with regard to displaced persons in Europe and Palestine and so forth. But there was a real growth in Truman's uh, attitudes and his uh, ability to to make distinctions, and he ultimately became uh, a champion for the establishment of Israel. It's a remarkable story. FDR and the Jews. Richard Brightman, along with Alan Leichman, the co-authors of this book, our guest today on the Bookmark program. Thank you so much for being with us today, sir. Thank you very much. That's Bookmark for this week. If you have comments or thoughts on future authors, send an email to us at our website, bookmark.us. That's our broadcast for today. Thanks for watching.